So we begin in silence. And we acknowledge that at this very moment we abide safely in the heart of sacred mystery and that this unnameable mystery seeks to find expression through who we are and how we live. So my prayer is may we come to know who we truly are and may we truly be here and may all of creation benefit from what we do here. So no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. On March the 15th of 2020, I came here to teach and this entire campus was shut down. And fortunately, thanks to Tim Leatherwood, we had been doing live streaming for a good while. So that was up. And fortunately, also on that Sunday, um, Holly Hud Hudley was co-teaching with me. We were in a rhythm where she was teaching with me about once a month. And um, I don't care how good of a performer you are, and this is a performance, it is difficult, if not impossible, and certainly dispiriting to speak to an empty room. And so I asked Holly that Sunday if she would continue to teach with me, and she agreed to. And um, we thought at the time that maybe we would be shut down five or six weeks, three or four. Um, that stretched into nearly 90 weeks. And with one or two exceptions, when one of us had to be out of town for some reason, Holly has brought herself and her perspective to these times. She's done so while being the parent of three teenage, pre-teenage boys and working on her PhD in evolutionary cosmology. She has done it without remuneration. It has been invaluable, not just to me, but to us. I could not have done, indeed endured this time without her. And I want you to know that, I want her to know that. And we said when we started back up on June the 6th that we were going to continue to co-teach, which we will, uh, and that some of, us, some of the time each of us would teach solo, which is what you're experiencing today. Um, and we're trying to find a rhythm. So I'm going to teach today and the next two Sundays, and so give us your feedback, whether you're watching online or not, and um, we'll find our way. Okay? It's going to work. So before we took our Christmas break, we taught a class on faith. And that class was our meditative reflections on a healing story that you find in the Gospel of John. Now we're doing a deep dive into the Gospel of John for a number of reasons. One is that I've never taught from the Gospel of John and I wanted to do that for my own discipline. Um, another reason is that the Gospel of John was produced in a time that was very similar to our own. The writers of John were giving expression to a new understanding both of Jesus and of his teachings. Their time was chaotic, so was ours. The politics of degradation seemed to sink to new lows on a daily basis. I'm not going to give you examples. You know them. But the Johannine community was experiencing the same thing. And at that time, they produced a vibrant understanding of faith and how that faith could shape their lives with joy and confidence and love and compassion. Now, our culture, current cultural context is causing many of us to feel muddled, tired, confused, hopeless, certainly worried about our country's future. And this joyless, aimless feeling has a word in the psychological lexicon. 
It's called languishing. And there was an article in the New York Times recently about this. It said that living in 2021 was like looking at life through a foggy windshield. Long haul COVID has really taken a toll. So on that first Sunday when we regathered, we had about 70 people in this room. I don't remember now what the analytics said about how many were watching online. Before the shutdown, we were averaging about 150 a Sunday. And um, Dr. Jim Bankston, who is here today, whose opinion I highly value on these matters, said, has said that we may never get back to where we were pre-COVID as a church in terms of attendance. And frankly, that is dispiriting. There is something about knowing that a number of people respond to what we have to say uh, enthusiastically that's encouraging. So when we in psychology think about mental well-being on a spectrum from depression to flourishing, um, we think of flourishing as a peak sense of well-being. Languishing is the absence of that. And the Times article said that languishing dulls your motivation, disrupts your ability to focus, and triples the odds that you will cut back on work. It's much more common than depression, but it's a bigger risk in many ways because if you don't address the sense of languishing, you will get depressed. So this condition, um, this class today is my contribution to wanting to turn this around. And I'm calling the class Responding to What Is in a Flourishing Way. Now, to uh, refresh your memory, the second of the signs in the book of signs in John is the healing of, a, of the official son. And uh, I'm going to reread the story in a minute. I just want to preface that by saying that this story is a parable. And I want to give you a mystery to ponder. Though our hearts long for the truth that leads to liberation, the first, oop, I went backwards. Hang on. Well, I can't get back there. Okay, though our hearts, this is the thing, though our hearts long for the truth that leads to liberation, the first reaction most of us have to the truth is that of defensiveness and fear. It has been said, Jesus said that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, but the truth is you shall know the truth and it will really tick you off. <laughs> and, and the great spiritual teachers have known this and they have worked out a device to get around the opposition of their hearers, and that device was a story. Jesus was a master at this, and some, so were some of his followers. They knew that the most entrancing words in any language are once upon a time. You can oppose the truth, you can resist the truth, but a story is virtually impossible to resist. So if you listen carefully to a story, you'll never be the same again. And that's because the story worms its way into our hearts. So if you are foolhardy enough to court enlightenment, be careful of stories or listen to them. Carry this story around with you all in your mind all week and dwell on it from time to time. Search it for a deep understanding, not of the story, but of yourself. What do you identify with? Well, here's the story. He was back in Cana of Galilee, the place where he made the water into wine. Meanwhile, in Capernaum, there was a certain official from the king's court whose son was sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and asked that he come down and heal his son, who was on the brink of death. Jesus put him off. Unless you people are dazzled by a miracle, you refuse to believe. But the court official wouldn't be put off. Come down. It's life or death for my son. Jesus simply replied, go home, your son lives. 
The man believed the bare word of Jesus spoke and headed home. On his way back, his servants intercepted him and announced, Your son lives. He asked them what time he began to get better. They said, The fever broke yesterday afternoon at 1 o'clock. The father knew that was the very moment Jesus had said, Your son lives. That clinched it. Not only he, but his entire household believed. This is now the second sign Jesus gave after coming from Judea into Galilee. Now, you remember that what Holly and I said about this story is that it continues to develop the character of Jesus as a boundary breaker and a border crosser. And it introduces us to this Johannine community's understanding of faith, those things. Now, I think this is critically relevant for us in our time because though faith is centrally, utterly central to the life Jesus seeks to inspire, I think few people could give you a good definition of faith. I think it's crucial for us to gain clarity because about it because one of the splits in our country right now and the split is fueled by ideology both religious and political is how people understand what it means to have faith on one side of the great divide are people who see that having faith is about believing certain things on the other side are those who see faith as a relationship and I, I make no secret of the fact that my personal belief is that people who see faith as belief has significantly distorted not only the meaning of faith, but what it means to follow Jesus. So I want to give you a brief synopsis about what we said about faith two weeks ago, and then we'll get into the language of flourishing. If you remember, I said the first definition of faith or the way that people see faith is as faith as a scent. That is, believing something to be true. This uh, understanding of faith is relatively new. It came into existence a little over 400 years ago with the uh, Reformation, Martin Luther. His cry was, the just shall live by faith. But what that came to mean was faith as it was defined by the Lutherans. And then when Calvin came along, faith became what was believed by the Calvinist, and then by the Anabaptist, and then by, you know how Protestants are good at dividing. So over a little over 400 years ago, it was only then that faith came to mean believing things. So after that class two weeks ago, someone came up to me and said, yes, but what about the creeds? They were written in the third and fourth centuries. Um, belief did not come to be confused with factuality until sometime in the Enlightenment. So the people who wrote and confessed the first creeds Never believe them literally as we understand what literal means. That was not part of their way of thinking. So please try to keep in mind, truth did not become confused with factuality until sometime in the Enlightenment. Prior to then, they would have taken the creeds as being true, but not literally true because true meant a different thing in their worldview. So believing all the right things won't make you happy. Believing all the right things won't set you free. Believing all the right things will not make you a loving person. The second meaning of the word faith <clears throat> is as fidelity, and that's easy to understand. In a relationship, we honor, we are faithful to that relationship and the person or people in that relationship. So faith is being faithful to is one. Another meaning of the word faith is trust. And I'm not going to, I'm going to amplify on this in, in a moment, but right now I just want to point out that trust too has nothing to do with beliefs. So the opposite of this kind of faith is mistrust. And in several places in the Jesus narratives, he's quoted as saying, 
why are you so anxious, you of little faith? All right. So if you want to know how your faith is going, check how anxious you are. The fourth meaning of the word faith is as a way of seeing, and <clears throat> this is what this class is about today, a way of seeing, because a way of seeing is what transforms our life. It transforms our living. You know, from the, the very beginning of my religious and theological studies and teachings, I have wanted to present what I taught in a <clears throat> non-sectarian way. Now, if you grew up in a church, you probably grew up in the church that your parents took you to. Or you grew up in a church that was influenced by where your friends went. And because of our developmental stages of children and young people, we believed it when our parents told us or other people in authority told us that our religion was the right one, right? I knew intellectually pretty early on that if my parents had been Methodist, I would have been Methodist. If they'd been Presbyterian, I would have been Presbyterian. If they'd been Roman Catholic, God forbid, but uh, <laughs> we were taught to hate the Catholics. That was just a Christian thing to do. If my parents had been Jewish or Buddhist or whatever, that's probably what I would have been, but I lucked out. I got born into the doctrinally correct position. And it was not until I began to meet other people who felt, thought, and believed exactly the same thing that I began to see how that position was not tenable. Consequently, uh, I wanted to develop a, a teaching context that was open to everyone. So I wanted no language that would exclude. I don't think the church should exclude people. I wanted to reinterpret for people who were caught in that faith is what you believe paradigm, what it mean, what it might mean to live out the values of peace, love, joy, patience, and humility um, in, a, in a way that did not bind you to some belief. And, and because my tradition is Christian, I have consistently used Jesus as my model. So learning about the Jesus of history, being part of the Jesus seminar, uh, learning what Jesus actually may have said has been very liberating to me. And I've taught a lot of that over the years in here. It's been enormously helpful. As a result of the kind of teaching I wanted to do, decades ago, I came up with something. I was influenced to do this by a Quaker scholar, Elton Trueblood, who was a philosopher, popular when I was in seminary. Uh, and by a Buddhist friend of mine, uh, Elton Trueblood is long since dead, my Buddhist friend is still alive, about the importance of having a daily spiritual practice. And people would ask in response, what is it? How do you do it? Um, and, and what does it consist of? So I came up with two sentences that, as far as I know, are original with me. Maybe other people have said them in different ways. But you've heard them a dozen times, if not more. The two sentences I came up with was, the central truth of and for spiritual practice is paying attention and developing the resources to be present to what is. Now, if you undertake this business about being present, the first lesson that you will learn out of having a meditative practice is failure then you'll learn humiliation because it's very difficult to be present. Without intending to offend anybody, most of you have not been fully present during this time today. Thinking about the plants you have to wrap tonight or what's going to be for dinner or did he really mean that? The second sentence of this is central to this spiritual practice is growing in the capacity to be non-judgmental. 
Now, this formula has worked well for me for decades. And I want to credit George Doherty, also now deceased, one of my early spiritual directors, for contributing um, the phrase, what is, to this formula that you just saw. George said that one of two things that caused people more relational and personal difficulty in life is what he called epistemological errors. And the first one is an, a failure to accept that what is is and what ain't ain't. Okay? If you go to a hardware store and order a hamburger, you're not going to get one. And you can complain, you can threaten, you can bargain, you can throw a temper tantrum, but hardware stores don't sell hamburgers. George said that making that epistemological era, meaning an era in how we think, contributes to half the problems that people have, relational problems. Now, the other half, which is not really relevant to this talk, but which I would be frustrated with if I were sitting where you were and the teacher didn't say what it was, is um, the other epistemological error we make is, I'm not happy now, but I will be when I can make you be different. All right? You ever tried to change somebody? Let me know how that goes. So yes, I stress the daily spiritual practice a lot. We charge our devices every day. Why not our souls, ourselves? Um, now, people who interpret faith as stuff you believe, they don't have to have a spiritual practice. For them, it's already taken care of. Because if you believe the right stuff, or if you belong to the right group, all is well. So. What we have in our society are people who swear unyielding allegiance to a rigid position, confusing that with finding an authentic connection with a life-giving relationship to sacred mystery. Some uh, time ago, Pastor Jeff McDonald, our senior minister, mentioned a book in one of his sermons. The book is the uh, Ragamuffin Gospel. Any of you read it? The subtitle of this book is Good News for the Bedraggle, Beat Up, and Burn Out. And I asked Jeff if he recommended it, and his response was an incredulous, you mean you haven't read this? <laughs> so I know I recommend a lot of books. I'm not necessarily recommending this to you. Uh, but I did want to read to you what Brendan Manning writes at the beginning of this book because it justifies my recommending books all the time. This is what he writes. He says, Evelyn Underhill said, spiritual reading is, or at least can be, second only to prayer as a developer and support of the inner life. And the message of the Wesleys, a document, contains this striking sentence. It cannot be that people should grow in grace unless they give themselves to reading. Now, I believe that sacred mystery provides for the illiterate in other ways, but we're not illiterate. We can read. And I think that it is a critical part of spiritual practice to get your head working about what your relationship to sacred mystery is. If you don't like to read, there are now audio books, although it's really hard to underline in an audio book. Now, I want to be clear. I am not wanting to create the illusion that we are saved by reading. I hope to amplify on today we're saved by faith. But the head work we do in spiritual practice is merely to live into the reality of what Jesus said. So often we have ears we don't hear. So often we have eyes we don't see. So the intellectual head work that we do is to open the space to help us to hear and see what we don't normally hear and see. To open our minds to the reality that we are already in, the, in a gracious relationship with God. And it's up to us to be open to that gracious experience. One of my favorite lines from Thomas Burton is, 
A saint is not someone who is good, but someone who experiences the goodness of God. Spiritual practice is designed to open us up to this reality so that we can see ourselves and so we can see each other. Desmond Tutu, who died last week, was absolutely convinced that this is what would cure the world's problems. Education about who you are and about who your neighbor is. And about that we treat each other as we would like to be treated. We live in a world where a growing number of people are not afraid of dictators. But they are afraid of living next to people who are different from them. That's a scary place to be. So are you with me? Okay. So what is? The central truth of and for spiritual practice is paying attention and developing resources to be present to what is. Well, what is? When you look at the world, what do you see? What lens do you use to see the world? MSNBC? Fox, CNN, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Week. Perhaps even more important, how do you respond to what is? Because how we see what is shapes our response to life. And there are three main ways that people have of seeing and responding to what is. I'm going to list each one of them briefly. We're going to come back to one of them uh, next week and really uh, amplify on it. What I want to show is how each of these ways of seeing shapes the response that we make to life and how we live life. And by the way, my theological influences for this are many, but I would give um, credit to Richard Niebuhr, who died way too early, and to the biblical and Jesus scholar Marcus Borg whom I mentioned a lot last week. These are my words, but these two men have powerfully influenced me over the years. I'm so grateful for their contribution to, the, to my thinking. The first way that you can see what is, is as hostile or threatening. Now, this in its extreme form is paranoia. People are out to get you. I have a t-shirt that I sometimes wear that says, I suffer from reverse paranoia. I believe that people are plotting to make me happy. <laughs> so for many people, when they hear the first noble truths of Buddhism, for example, that convey the message, you're not getting out of here alive. Um, they hear that as a downer and they react negatively. Did you know that five billion years from now, the sun's gonna burn out? When I was a child and got that information, it was disturbing to me, <laughs> seriously. The bottom line is that we and everything that is are destined for oblivion. That's what it is. Have a nice day. So if you see life as hostile, if you see life as threatening, what's going to be your response? Guns and ammo. Now, I got to tell you, and I hope you don't find this offensive, and I'm going to come back and amplify on this next week. This is the way most of us are infected with seeing what is. This is the way Christianity sees the world. I mean, not how Jesus saw the world, how the Christianity that developed in the fourth and fifth century sees the world. It's not in John. This is why we need a new form of Christianity. Um, most people have grown up with an understanding of God is that God is out to get you. Unless you believe the right things, unless you do the right things, unless you belong to the right group, unless you perform the right rituals, you're in for it. Not just in for it, you're in for a hell of a time. 
Is that good news? So next week I'm going to come back with a counter to this point of view. Uh, but for now, this is what Christianity has become, the Western world. The God of this Christianity is a violent God, a killer God. And of course, this informs our politics. The Christianity that came to this land, formed the colonies, and then the country has thrived on violence. I'll give you one example. This past week was the anniversary of the massacre at Wounded Knee. It took place in South Dakota in 1890. 23 years earlier, the local tribes had signed a treaty with the United States government that guaranteed them access to the land around and rights to the land around Black Hills, which was to them sacred land. The treaty said that not only could no one else move there, but no one could travel through there without express consent from the Indians. But then something happened. Know what it was? Hmm? Gold. Gold was discovered in the Black Hills. So the treaty was broken. People from the Sioux tribe were forced onto a reservation with the promise of food and supplies, which never came. So why did the white man do this? Because his religion informed him that he had a manifest destiny to make this country a light upon a hill, which, of course, took money, and gold was money. Now, this is not the place or time to say how the massacre came about. But when it was over, Black Elk, a uh, famous medicine man, said, and bury my heart at wounded knee, I did not know then how much was ended. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, I can still see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered all along the crooked gulch, as plain as when I saw them with eyes still young. And I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was bur buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream. The second way you can see what is, is as indifferent. The cosmos may be filled with wonder, which it is, but so what? And this is probably the most common way that people have of responding to what is if they don't see the world as hostile. The universe is made up of matter and energy. Swirling masses of atoms interact with each other. It's brought us forth, but it's basically indifferent to us. And I am seeing more and more of this in people I interact with on a regular basis. They say things like, yes, things are pretty bad, hopeless, but what can you do? You know, just enjoy it while you're able. I'm even hearing more of my own friends say, you know, I'm dying at just the right time. I don't want to be around for what's coming. The third way you can see what is, is as life-giving, as nourishing, as miraculous, as amazing. It is amazing that we're here at all, that we have the capacity to think and reflect and create and interact with each other and with our environment. Now, you know there's a theological word for this. It's called grace. It's big in the Methodist denomination, grace. We got more kinds of grace than you can shake a stick at. God is gracious. Life is gracious. And I think this is the worldview to which Jesus is inviting us. And it generates a response that is very different from the first two. The most important thing about responding to life this way is that it frees us from anxiety. Further, it sets us free to love and to be compassionate. Uh, Jim Finley is the first person I heard say something that just has been like glue for me in this way of responding to life. Jim said, the grace and love of God protect us from nothing, but sustain us in everything. 
And that's what you see in the saints. Whether the saints you know or saints in this church that we don't know by name or don't see them as saints. And this is the response that empowers us to live with peace and love and joy and patience and humility. There is an understanding of the Christian faith which I think is not faith at all. I, I think it's disbelief. Think about it. If your God is like a loose cannon, firing broadsides to let us know who's in charge, you're likely to become fearful or worse, violent yourself, because we become like the God we worship. If your understanding of God is as an impersonal cosmic force, your religion will be vague and noncommittal. A loving God fosters loving people. Now, over a wide period of history, centuries, good people, our parents and grandparents and their grandparents and all the way back, have believed a wide variety of things. There was a time when people believed in slavery. And there was a time when people believed in human sacrifice. There was, we've, you can find all sorts of beliefs. And even now, you can probably find a support group for anything you want to do. What I'm saying is that we're entering a period of history where we don't need new stuff to believe. We need new ways of believing. In his book, A New Kind of Christianity, Brian McLaren imagines a time when a time machine is invented that allows people from the year 3012 to come back and take some of us to that time. And um, to, they, they want to interview us to see what life was like on Earth in 2022. Now, we are, as you can imagine, a big news event for 3012. And so we are invited to be on a talk show. Now, I don't think there are going to be talk shows in 3012, but this is a talk in active imagination. So someone calls in to ask us questions. And the first question is, is it true that you claim to believe in God and yet still wage wars? And we stammer, oh, yeah, well, there, see, there's this just war theory that we thought up. Um, it says that um, if we believe our cause is just, we have the right to wage war. And they ask, well, what about the other side? Don't they believe their cause is just too? And we wish that we were not on this talk show right now. <laughs> and another person says, uh, did you really kill your fellow creatures for food? Weren't you aware that all life is sacred and the planet can only sustain a certain number of meat eaters? It reminds me of something uh, which Bishop Tutu said. It's a kind of theological folly to suppose that God has made the entire world just for human beings or to suppose that God is interested in only one of the millions of species that inhabit God's good earth. Thank you, Wayne, for that. We do our best to respond to the question, but it's based on assumptions we don't have, and besides, there is nothing quite so good as a thick, juicy steak right off the grill. <laughs> so a third caller calls in and asks about our use of fossil fuels. Why, when you knew about it, did you make the planet so toxic? Throwing the climate into such imbalance that it caused billions of deaths and millions of extinctions. It's hard to believe that believers in God would participate in anything so destructive. I'm not saying that it doesn't matter what we believe. It does. And that's what I want to end today talking about. About what does it mean to have beliefs from the standpoint of being Christian? What does it mean to learn to speak flourishing Christian? Well, I think there are three things that it means. First, it's the belief that God is real. Now, this affirmation is very, very different from saying that God exists. God does not exist as a tree exists or as a rock exists. But as Marcus Borg writes, 
the Bible and all the enduring religions of the world unambiguously affirm that there is, and I love this construction of words, a stupendous, magnificent, wondrous more. God is a level or layer of reality that is all around us as well as in us. God is not a person out there. God is here. God is here. You can't go anywhere where God is not. I'd put that another way. You don't have to die to go to heaven. Central to the Christian understanding of faith is the centrality of Jesus. Being Christian or speaking Christian in contrast with being Muslim or Buddhist or Jewish Meaning, seeing Jesus as a life full of what God looks like. I can affirm this without needing to say that Jesus is the only or the only adequate way of seeing. Krista Stendhal, who was dean of Harvard Divinity School when I was there, said, <clears throat> We can sing our love songs to Jesus with wild abandon without needing to tell dirty stories about other religions. Third, being Christian means acknowledging that the Bible is our foundational and identity document. This does not mean seeing the Bible as inerrant or infallible. It isn't. And it is horribly misread. More again about this next week. But what I'll say right now is that a faithful way of viewing our beliefs about the Bible might be simply labeled loosely. That is, we want to avoid the human tendency toward the sin of certainty. This way of seeing God, Jesus, and the Bible is not a belief. It's a vision. It's not something to believe in in order to be saved. It's something that draws us forward into a larger life and living with the capacity for bringing in large lives and living into the world. And that's why we're here. To believe then means not to give mental assent to something, but to give my heart to something. You remember, right up until the time of the Enlightenment, the meaning of the word believe was to be love, to hold dear. And it's by loving and being loved that we flourish. Got it? And no matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this. You carry precious cargo, so watch your weight, and I'll see you here next Sunday. Thank you. <clears throat>